Good morning. Welcome to University of Pennsylvania, the Weingarten Center. This is our last day of the Virtual Disability Symposium with our theme, Reflecting Upon the Past, Planning for the Future. Thank you for joining us over the past five Thursdays and now today where we have a lineup of incredible advocates, educators, activists, writers who are going to be presenting their own journeys and, and the lessons they've learned and what they can share with us about disability. My name is Jane Hollihan. I'm the Executive Director of the Weingarten Center, and I am so delighted to introduce uh, Dr. Mumta Akapati, who is the Vice Provost for University Life. Just a little bit about Mumta. She defines her work by saying, my job is to believe in other people's children. She oversees a collaborative collective, collective of departments that support 25,000 undergraduate, graduate, and professional students as well as Penn faculty, staff, families, alumni, and community members. Dr. Akapati came to Penn in 2020 from Rollins College, where she served as Vice President for Student Affairs, following four years as Dean of Student Life at Oregon State University. Her prior experience at her alma mater, the University of Texas at Austin, includes roles as University Ombudsman, Diversity Educator, Education Coordinator, Advisor to Greek Life and Education, Coordinator of the International Teaching Assistant Program, and Assistant Director of the Multicultural Ed Information Center. Recognized nationally as a student affairs thought leader and practitioner, she chaired the NASPA Undergraduate Fellowship Program, which named its annual Outstanding Undergraduate Student Award in her honor. She earned a bachelor's master's and PhD in microbiology, all from the University of Texas at Austin. One thing that Mumta has inspired me is to think radically. And so she's gonna be presenting her own thoughts about inclusion, accessibility. Mumta, thank you for being here. Oh, Jane, thank you so much. I really, really appreciate your kindness and this invitation. I just wanna be sure, um, Folks can hear me okay, right? Just want to be sure that, um, okay, that's great. So, um, you know, whenever you hear people describe yourself, you're like, oh my gosh, who is that person? I think this is the function of like time. Over time, we get gifted the opportunities to do certain things. And so, um, Jane, thank you so much for the kind introduction and the invitation to be a better human um, as we move um, into the future. Um, you know, I'm so grateful to offer um, introductory reflections. It sounds like you all have been doing um, the really meaningful and tough um, work um, around really um, making the world more equitable, more just, more loving, more present as we think about the range of abilities and ways that our students uh, learn um, and then prepare themselves to pursue their best lives beyond graduation. I want to start with the story, um, and so um, because I think one of the things that I really try to to center myself in is the um, are the privileged identities that I bring to the table. So um, today I um, have privilege as it relates to most of my abilities. Um, um, I am able-bodied in any way that that um, I think matters in our definitions and distinctions, um, and I, I bring this up to say that. You know, when we talk about privilege and power and diversity and equity and inclusion, we all have dominant identities. And so I want this to be the thing that brings us together because I'm often in spaces as a woman where I'm talking about, you know, here's where men can do better or in race where I'm saying, here are where my white allies can, can um, be part of the solution. And so I want to critique myself in my space of privilege. Um, around my um, able-bodiedness today in ways that I, you know, mess up. So um, I remember, uh, it's been over a decade at this point, when I was teaching a graduate level class in higher education. And I was just, I was so proud. I was just giving myself high fives because I uh, had organized my class readings far in advance of the beginning of the semester. And I put the readings um, necessary in PDF format because I knew that that would be um, 
uh, accessible um, in a way that, that those readings could be accessible for a student who I knew used a screen reader uh, for the class readings. And I was just so proud of myself and again, giving myself little kudos awards for, for, for doing something in advance so a student wouldn't be delayed in their access to the course materials, which often happens, right? When, when we find out um, um, some of the things that students need and then they get delayed access to course materials because they may not be ready for them. Well, little did I realize that the way that I had organized the PDF documents, the documents were too large, it was difficult, and I'd actually created a greater problem um, for the student to access their course materials. But here's the thing, I was sitting in my space of privilege and um, giving myself my personal gold stars. And it was a reminder of how easy it is for us in our space of privilege, um, in our space of good intendedness to think that we are doing enough. Um, and so I need to hold myself accountable to all of you that I don't think I'm doing enough. And I want to um, publicly commit to all of you that I know that I need to do better and be better and be more humble, um, especially in this space and this privileged identity that I carry of the many privileged identities that I carry. Um, and I also want to offer deep gratitude to all of you because here's the thing, uh, when I think of uh, the work that we do, and specifically the work that all of you do, when I think about the world of accessibility services, I really think about the frame of being a student ready campus and community, right? And I know that that's a catchphrase that we use in higher education, but I wanna expand on that more. I think about how many wisdoms, how many ways of knowing and being and learning have generationally been weeded out because our systems do not honor the wisdoms and truths and the ways that our students may have historically come to us at our institutions. And the work that you all do amplifies the wisdoms that come to the table in higher education and then subsequently into the professional world. Um, and I can't think of a greater form of love and a greater form of access um, than the ways in which you all serve and care for students. And I know that, um, you know, do we all have better to do? Absolutely. But the fact that we stay in it um, is something that I just want to take this moment and pause and remind ourselves why it's important that we stay in it, that it is because of all of you, because of all of us working together, we have a duty of care to make sure that we maximize the wisdoms, the truths, the ways of knowing and being of folks that have historically not had access to higher education because our systems did not honor those truths and the ways of knowing and being um, that we have this duty of care to make sure that those wisdoms enter industry, that enter education, that enter you know, all of our professional worlds. And so I just, I come to you with humility and with gratitude um, for you taking this time to be in community today and for the past um, several weeks. Um, and I hold you all sacred. So thank you so much for this opportunity to be in community with you. Mumta, thank you so much. This is being recorded. I'm going to have to listen to this several times because you just provoke so much thought that something that we all have to take messages away from, from, this, from this, um, this message. So thank you, Mumta, for what you have done. I appreciate it. And I'm not gonna hold anything up I am turning everything over to my good colleagues, Chanel and Sharon. I just want to say this, that over the past several uh, months, every single Weingarten Center colleague has come to the, um, has come as a team to work together to make sure that this labor of love comes into the disability symposium. So I'm stepping out and turning it over to um, Chanel. Thank you, Chanel, and thank you, Mamta. Thank you, Jane, and thank you, Monta, as well, for such inspiring words this morning. Good morning to all of you, Blue Jeans Early Risers, and welcome again to the final day of the 20th Annual Weingarten Center Dis Disability Symposium uh, with this year's theme, Reflecting Upon the Past, Planning for the Future. Again, my name is Chanel Boatswain. I am a learning specialist uh, with the Weingarten Center, and I am excited to moderate today's opening session with my colleague, Sharon Douglas who is the Manager of Academic Accommodations at the Wine Garden Center. Thank you again for joining us. As a reminder, closed caption uh, is available at the bottom left corner of your screen. And this session is being recorded and will be available 
uh, next month. If you are joining for, uh, if this is your first session for the symposium, complete details uh, of the symposium presentations, including speaker bios and recordings of the previous sessions are currently posted on the website. Let's get into today's session. So the first of our three presentations today is Disability Culture and Its Impact on Higher Education, Growing Disability Culture in College with Rebecca Coakley. Let me just share a little bit with you about our speaker. Rebecca Coakley is Program Officer for the Office of U.S. Disability Rights with the Ford Foundation. Rebecca joined the Ford Foundation in January of 2021 as the first U.S. Program Officer to oversee a disability rights portfolio. She previously served as the co-founder and director of the Disability Justice Initiative at the Center for American Progress. A three-time presidential appointee for President Barack Obama, Rebecca served at the U.S. Department of Education, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, and at the White House, where she oversaw diversity and inclusion efforts. Rebecca's work has been well celebrated. In 2020, she was awarded the Richmond Distinguished Fellow in Public Life for Brandeis University. Rebecca has spoken at Netroots Nation, New York City Comic Con, Yale University, the Women's March National Conference, and has given TEDx talks, uh, as well as been a guest on MSNBC last and last week, excuse me, last week tonight with John Oliver. Rebecca is just getting started and she is currently working on her first book, so stay on the lookout. While Rebecca facilitates this incredible portfolio of work with the support of her family, <clears throat> she is particularly proud to be partner to her spouse, Patrick, and mother to her three children. We are quite fortunate to have Rebecca here to talk with us today. And before I turn it over to Rebecca, I just want to remind us, uh, remind the audience that the slides and the recording will be available and that there's closed captioning on your screen. We encourage you as an audience throughout this presentation to share your questions uh, Rebecca will pause periodically throughout the presentation to address your questions. Without further ado, I turn it over to Rebecca Copley. Thanks again for being here with us. Thank you so much. It is such a pleasure to be here with all of you today. Um, my name is Rebecca Copley, um, and uh, I am a redheaded little person. I am sitting at my, my home in New Jersey. Um, in front of my fireplace. I am wearing a black jacket um, and may end up at various points throwing on my glasses. We'll see how I'm doing today. Once I hit 43, I, I am dreading the edge of the need for bifocals, which shows sort of my own internalized ableism in this moment. So we'll just see how we go. Um, let's go to the first slide, please, or the next slide, please. Uh, so I have the pleasure, as uh, as it was said, of being the first U.S. Disability Rights Program Officer at the Ford Foundation. Uh, Ford's journey in this space uh, of disability grant making has been um, rather complicated in some ways. Back in 2016, our CEO, Darren Walker, uh, just joined the foundation and committed to dedicating the foundation's funding to the broad cause of social justice. And when he talked about social justice, Darren talked about racial justice, he talked about gender justice, he talked about LGBT equality, um, he talked about immigrant rights. And as you all know in the disability space, ABD does not mean all but dissertation, it means all but disability. And so myself and a number of other advocates in the community did what we tend to do best, and we trolled him. We trolled him really badly. <laughs> on the internet, on Twitter, on Facebook, on, on every platform that was available. And to his credit, um, and this is why I love working for him today, he invited us in to sit down and talk to him. And so we shared how it felt to be continually denied as part of the broader social justice work. We shared the fact that you cannot get to social justice as long as people with disabilities are not part of the conversation, are not able to access the table, and do not have the same access to the same means and opportunities that other marginalized communities have. And to his credit, he took it really seriously. And so he first started out by dedicating funding across the foundation to the cause of disability rights. 
And so every program officer at the foundation is expected to grant make on issues related to disability policy, the priorities of the disability community, and disabled people's organizations. Even beyond that, he called together a coalition of foundations, what's called the President's Council on Disability Inclusion and Philanthropy, which is made up of 17 other foundation CEOs that have committed to the same thing, that have committed to increasing the hiring of people with disabilities inside of philanthropy, and have committed to the grant making to disability organizations um, from their from their vast um, funds that are available. And then about a little over a year and a half ago, he reached out to me and said, Rebecca, we're thinking about building out a program of work. Would you be interested in applying for the job? And to be quite honest, I was. I It was towards the end of the election cycle. Um, I was at the Center for American Progress at the time and did not have an interest at that point in joining the uh, what was potentially going to be the Biden administration. Um, and so I thought about, hey, maybe it is time to pursue something a little bit different. Um, and that's a long way from where I grew up. Um, I grew up on a community college campus. My mom ran a disabled student services office. Um, and my dad ran a center for independent living. So I like to say, because it was quite literally, it was quite literal, I grew up rolling into the movement on the back of my dad's power chair as soon as I could stand. Um, and that to me is a privilege, having grown up in this space, having grown up surrounded by amazing people with disabilities, people who had high expectations for people with disabilities. And that is not always the norm for a lot of disabled people. And I imagine that's not always the norm for a lot of the students. Can we go to the next slide, please? Before I get started, I really wanna welcome you. And I wanna pay particular attention to welcoming people with disabilities into this conversation. Whether or not you self-identify, whether or not you might be a person who lives with substance abuse and is in recovery, has, has a condition that comes and goes, may not even have a diagnosis, but knows that there is something different about them that they're trying to figure out. Welcome to the space. Our community is infinitely stronger because of your presence. And I am so excited to have you here today. Next slide, please. So who are we talking about um, when we talk about uh, people with disabilities on college campuses? We know that roughly 19% of male students in college have a disability, 20% of female students. And mind you, let's be real, all of these statistics are pre-COVID. -pre 40% of undergrad students with disabilities who started in 2011 graduated with a bachelor's from the same institution uh, within six years versus 57% of students without disabilities. Students with disabilities are more likely to experience financial hardship. On social media, we call this the CRIP tax, where households with disabilities on average have $17,000 a year of additional expenses that are not encountered by households without people with disabilities. We also know that housing insecurity increased significantly during the pandemic. Students with disabilities are less likely to feel welcome on college campuses or feel supported by their institution than students without disabilities. And according to a survey in 2020, 70% of students with mental health disabilities were not registered to receive accommodations on campus. And one third of students with mental health disabilities stated that they were not aware that they were eligible for such accommodations. And so the conversation about privilege that started this, this dialogue today has me thinking about that a lot. I am a person with a very visible disability. I have achondroplastic dwarfism. Um, both of my parents had the same disability I did. Um, I also am a person that lives with the anxiety and I am a person that has a really wonky heart condition um, that acts up every three or four years ago or so, and then it needs to get zapped and it goes away for a while. The reason I share all of these things is because I understand the privilege that I have as a person with a visible disability when I go into a space and ask for accommodations. People don't typically question me about my need for a step stool, about my inability to carry more than, you know, 15 pounds in a backpack, um, you know, about my need to be able to reach an elevator's buttons 
or the paper towel dispenser in the restroom. Um, however, as time has gone on and I've acquired uh, hidden disabilities, I've seen firsthand sort of the doubt that people encounter when, when asking for accommodations. And even further, I think in this time of long haul COVID, the need for organizations like Disabled Student Services on college campuses, like Centers for Independent Living, to actually reach out and engage students with disabilities. I feel like we're in this place because we know that often when it comes to budget season, um, we ask for scraps and are told to be thankful for crumbs, that we don't do the level of outreach we really should do. And I think a lot of people, particularly with mental health disabilities, with chronic health conditions, um, with things that have traditionally been gendered, fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue, um, uh, let's see, fibro uh, fibroids, um, migraines, we never tell those people that those conditions are in fact disabilities. So one of the most powerful things about the ADA is the definition of disability, and yet we often don't do enough to actually communicate the power of that definition to the communities and the students that we're trying to reach. Next uh, slide, please. So the history of disability on campus. You know, prior to the Rehabilitation Act, students with disabilities were not on campus. Um, students, if they wanted to attend college, they often had to attend via phone. This is obviously before the internet days. And as we saw a move towards integration, we still really struggled with this notion of programmatic segregation, being told what sorts of things you can and should study as a person with a disability. On the employment side, we tend to call this the, the eight Fs of disability employment, food, filth, fetching, folding, filing, flowers, festive, and friendly. They're not jobs that are often grounded in a level of high expectations. They're not jobs that often have the ability for promotion and advancement. Um, and really prior to 504 and even you know after that, prior to the ADA, there, and today in many cases, there still is a real struggle for students with disabilities to achieve the kind of goals that they want to professionally. It's also important to remember that Disabled Student Services started at UC Berkeley, where a bunch of disabled students were segregated in the hospital wing of the university because there were no accessible dorms, and they turned it into a frat house. Because it's important to remember that when you segregate a marginalized community and then put them into a situation where they're the majority inside a smaller space, they tend to rebel. They tend to emulate the behaviors we see in the majority culture. So these were college kids being college kids. They created a program that still exists today on so on most on pretty much every college campus in the country. Um, but at the time it had more wraparound services and it equally centered disability culture with compliance as they were actually developing the compliance mechanisms through policy advocacy at the state level. You know, they, today we see complicated relationships that disabled student services offices serve between managing the relationships with faculty and managing the relationships with students. And one of the most interesting trends I think we're really starting to see now is the modern move to be increasingly more inclusive of students with intellectual and developmental disabilities. And I sincerely hope as we move into this next uh, innovation, that we are thoughtful and think about how do we avoid some of the missteps before. Um, the other thing that I think it's really important to note about the history of disability on campus is that when you look at the majority of innovations in the field of education, they come out of educating students with disabilities. Whether it be universal design for learning, whether it be various uses of technology, to develop learning plans and provide education to students. So many of these things come out of the needs that face that students with disabilities had. And yet we've completely erased that. And we often treat students with disabilities as the problem instead of a place for innovation and solutions. So that's something I wanna challenge everyone to be thinking about. It's, it's the revolutionary tradition not just structurally, 
but in terms of education policy and education advancements over the last 40 plus years. Next slide, please. I love this slide. Um, the, this slide includes a photograph of Gallaudet University from 1988 during the Deaf President Now protest, where the students seized control of the campus throughout the teachers, faculty, and administration, and demanded that the Board of Regents give them a Deaf President. Because at that point in time, Gallaudet University, one of two institutions of higher education for the Deaf community in the United States, um, did not had not ever had a deaf president. I, I share this because it's important to remember that movements are built on the backs of young people and that that truly happens on college campuses, whether it be the rolling quads at Berkeley, as I was talking about earlier, turning the hospital of uh, UC Berkeley into a frat house. Um, the students at Hofstra who organized shortly after the folks at Berkeley, even though they likely say that they organized at the same time, if not before, um, the Deaf President Now campaign is shown here in, in the photograph. The creation of a National Disabled Student Union, which existed in the late 1990s through the early aughts and sought to build solidarity nationwide for disabled student unions on college campuses. And what we're seeing really today is in, in large part because of a pushback to, to COVID-19 policies, growth of organic groups like the UC Access Now campaign that are pushing the universities of California to be more inclusive of students with disabilities and ensure that the accommodations that students have had for the last several years are not denied moving forward. Uh, next slide, please. The goal of disability rights was never independent living. It was interdependence. I share this quote from Ed Roberts, who's considered the father of the independent living movement and was the lead rabble rouser at Berkeley, um, taking over the hospital. Uh, at the time. And Ed Roberts was a person who lived with polio um, and used an iron lung. He actually attended the same high school I did, but obviously almost uh, half a century before I did. And at the time, um, he was told he would never go to college or high school. Um, and so he attended classes largely by telephone at that point in time. Um, you know, and then obviously went on to Berkeley. Um, his career was pretty amazing. Ed served as the first ever physically disabled or apparently disabled MacArthur genius um, and was the only one until last year, actually, when Josh Miel got named, um, who is a, a blind scientist at MIT. Um, Ed was very open about what he thought the directions of the disability community needed to be. And a, a big piece of that was you know, while there was this push towards the notion of disabled students as independent, the reality is, is none of us are independent. Nobody can do everything completely on their own. And I think if there's anything we've seen over the last couple of years of the pandemic is that everybody is truly interdependent. We need each other. We need each other emotionally. We need each other physically. Um, and until we break out of that success equals independence, or you must be independent to be successful, we aren't actually going to see the outcomes that we want to see with students with disabilities on college campuses. Next slide, please. So what do we mean by disability? We use the term impairment to specifically talk about a medical diagnosis, but we know that disability is largely a social construct. It's an identity, it's a community, and it's a culture. Next slide, please. You know, we, we talk a lot about inclusion, and it's important to remember that inclusion is different than integration. And I like this, this uh, little comic here where it shows a square that says the system, and a square is cut out of it wearing a, a tie and says, you're going to have to change to fit into the system. And then a bunch of circles that say, or how about you change the system so that we can all fit. And I think that's what we're really fighting for as students with disabilities. We don't want to just be put into spaces. Um, we want to actually succeed and thrive and see those spaces be built around the needs of people with disabilities. Next slide, please. So what is ableism? And the definition that I use comes from Talila T.L. Lewis, who does phenomenal work on the issues facing um, deaf and disabled people who are incarcerated. And the definition is a system that places value on people's bodies and minds 
based on societally constructed ideas of normality, intelligence, excellence, desirability, and productivity. These constructed ideas are deeply rooted in anti-Blackness, eugenics, misogyny, colonialism, imperialism, and capitalism. This form of systemic oppression leads to people and society determining who is valuable and worthy based on a person's language, appearance, religion, and or their ability to, or to satisfactorily produce, reproduce, and behave. You do not have to be disabled to experience ableism. Um, when this definition first came out, it um, was pretty revolutionary. It shook a lot of folks in the community. It shook a lot of people who had been writing in the disability studies space um, for a long time and very explicitly because of its connection to white supremacy. And yet at the same time, it is so relevant, it is so true. When we look at the data of the incarceration rates of people of color with disabilities, when we look at suspension and expulsion rates of students of color with disabilities, um, when we look at law enforcement abuse, all of those things are tied to the nexus of ableism and racism. Um, one of the first mental illnesses that was sort of developed out of the United States was something called drapetomania, uh, which is commonly referred to as runaway slave syndrome. Um, they actually create, slave masters created a mental illness um, to allow them to uh, give further enforcement authority to slave patrols to go after and reincarcerate those who had escaped under the auspices that they weren't really trying to escape. They were mentally ill, and it was for their good that they be placed back under the custody of slave owners. Um, and so it's really important historically as a, as a disability community that we don't forget this inextricable relationship um, between racism and ableism and understand that it, it um, the two can't be separated. Um, it's also important. Um, when we think about the events of the last week and we think about the Oscars, most people do not realize that alopecia areata is a disability under the Americans with Disabilities Amendments Act of 2008. Um, one of the cases that the ADA Amendments Act was specifically um, entrusted to fix was a case of somebody experiencing alopecia who was discriminated against um, because they had alopecia, which is an autoimmune disease, which impacts hair growth, but also attacks somebody's immune system. And the um, and the Amendments Act was entire was was you know one of the it was set up specifically to help fix that. And yet we live in a society where people are really quick to say, well, that's not a disability, or that's not a disability, without doing the homework. But as it says here. You do not have to be disabled to experience ableism. Somebody can assume that you're disabled. Someone can assume whether because of physical appearance, whether you um, dress differently, whether you behave differently, that you have a disability, even if you may not. And that still is valid ableism. We can go to the next slide, please. So how do we move from this to building culture? Um, and if anyone has thoughts or questions, please feel free to put them in the chat. I'm really curious what you all are thinking. Next slide, please. So we have to address disability inequities and address race and poverty of students with disabilities if we're actually going to talk about how we create disability culture on college campuses. It, it's important to remember that women with disabilities are less likely to work than men. African Americans with disabilities are 70% more likely than whites with disabilities to be unemployed. Women with disabilities are 25% more likely to live in poverty. Latinx folks with disabilities are 30% more likely to live in poverty and African Americans with disabilities are 60% more likely to live in poverty. Um, I think it was about two weeks ago that we had equal pay day, which is the day that um, white women uh, make equal to what white men in their field have made the previous year. Um, this data has horrifically left out students with disabilities for, or people with disabilities for a long time. Um, and the reasoning behind that is the specific 
issues tied to the Fair Labor Standards Act and the perpetuation of a subminimum wage. If um, women's groups that have lauded the creation of Equal Pay Day were truly being inclusive, they would have to acknowledge the fact that they uphold up a system that still perpetuates people with disabilities making as little as $2.17 a week. Um, I'm very excited that actually some of our grantees later this year are going to actually uh, release the data on what is Equal Pay Day for people with disabilities and be able to break it down across race and gender. So in uh, the chat, Julianne asks, what would I like to see colleges and universities do to change the system to be more inclusive of students with disabilities? We're actually getting there, so I'm excited about your question. Next slide, please. Um, the other piece of this is actually ensuring that disability status is truly integrated as part of diversity, equity, and inclusion. There is no inclusion without people with disabilities. The term itself is a term of art that comes out of the education of disabled students. And so as we're looking at the push around DEI or DNI or JEDI or whatever it's being called this week where you might be working, it is imperative that people with disabilities be at the table. It's also imperative that we acknowledge that race, race, ethnicity, and gender exacerbate the inequities that people face, and that people with disabilities bring varied expertise to the table. And thinking about how is this reflected in the work that we do? When we're hiring for jobs, are we ensuring that we're posting to places that get information out to people with disabilities? Are we working to bring in internship programs into our university that specifically recruit and place interns with disabilities to make our university not just seen as a place where people can learn, but as a place where people can learn, thrive, and find jobs as they move forward, which is historically not the case for students with disabilities. Next slide, please. The laborious expectation of education. Um, this is a, a slide that is dedicated to Jim Sinclair, who uh, titled something uh, the self-narrating zoo exhibit phenomenon. Um, and I think that this is a case that faces a lot of students with disabilities, and we have to collectively as a field think about how do we talk about this. When you are a person with a disability, when you are a young person with a disability trying to access the services that you need, to learn, to work, to thrive. The systems by which we operate put us in a position, put young people in a position where they have to tell the worst case story possible to get the minimum level of aid that they need. Um, they have to talk about how hard it is, how miserable it is being disabled in order to get the extra set of books in many cases, in order to get the note taker. Um, there's a, a level of traumatic voyeurism I think a lot of people have talked about experiencing in the in the DSS space um, being pushed from those uh, outside of our community to share for others education with really no regard or acknowledgement for the trauma that people experience. Um, I sit on the board of the DC ACLU uh, until the end of the year since I've moved to New Jersey. And one of the things that we have started doing um, is providing uh, a stipend for therapy services for people who are forced to tell the story of their trauma um, as part of the advocacy work that the DC ACLU is doing. And it kind of blew my mind that that A, that our board, that our organization was doing it. I was really proud of them. But B, as a disabled person, thinking about all the times that I have been pushed to tell my worst case scenario story. Thinking about all the time, just to be able to communicate the, the sincerity of the need that myself and my community have. And how do we move past that in the education space? How do we create a space where students are assumed um, to, to know what they need, and we respect that, and we support them in that. Next slide, please. Moving past the minimum. Um, this is probably my favorite tweet ever. Um, and so it's a tweet by someone on Twitter named Jennifer Lee Rossman. Um, and she's replying to a guy named Daniel Lawson, where Daniel Lawson tweeted, 
Disabled parking should only be available during business hours, nine to five, Monday through Friday. I cannot see any reason why people with disability, genuine disabilities would be out beyond these times. And she responded, and I laugh every time I see this, we're disabled, Daniel, we are not werewolves. And I think that that's, that really does highlight another issue that we tend to see on college campuses, which is while we may be able to access the classroom, we may be able to access the curriculum, how truly included are we on campus life? Are we able to, is there a bar on campus? Is it accessible? Are we able to go to the fraternity and sorority houses? Are we able to um, have the accommodations we need should we wanna run for office on campus? Um, when everyone else is being signed up to vote, does the Disabled Student Services Office sign disabled students up to vote? What does it mean to be truly included in society beyond this notion that all disabled people need or deserve is the bare minimum? So remember, we are disabled. We are not werewolves. Next slide. Moving from reality to justice. Um, there's a bunch of different iterations of this slide. This is the one that I tend to like. Um, it's the people standing on boxes where the first one is uh, the tallest person is on like seven boxes, medium height person's on one box. Um, the shortest dude, I always think of that as me, is sitting in a hole and they're all standing behind a fence trying to watch a baseball game. And it says one gets more than is needed while the other gets less than is needed. Thus a huge disparity is created. Equality ends up with all three of them standing on one box each. The tall dude can still see over the fence. The medium dude is about chin level at the fence. And the short dude, me, is still staring at the fence. It says the assumption is that everyone benefits from the same supports. So we've given everybody one box and they should be happy about it because they're all being treated equally. The next frame is equity. And the tall guy does not have a box he's standing on. The medium guy is standing on one box. And I've finally been given two boxes. And it says everyone gets the support they need, which produces equity. But the reality is, is that they are still stuck behind the fence. And the last slide sees justice and the, the fence itself is removed. And it says all three can see the game without supports or accommodations because the cause of the inequity was addressed. The barrier itself was removed versus us continuing to try to think how do we enable them to get around the barrier. Why not just remove the barrier to begin with? Next slide, please. So what does justice look like? This is the disability justice framework developed by SINS Invalid, which is a disability justice collective out in the Bay Area. Um, this document is available on their website if you look at SINS Invalid, if you just look up SINS Invalid. And they created a framework because they understood that the traditional modeling around disability rights was not enough. It was not going to get us justice. And that policy cannot be the end all be all of all things. And as a policy nerd, I begrudgingly agree with them. They talk about the need for us collectively in our disabled spaces and our spaces that should be centering disabled people like disabled student services to really ground themselves in intersectionality to really think deeply about the intersecting oppressions that are faced by disabled students. The leadership of those most impacted, anti-capitalism, cross-movement solidarity. How are you building in relationships with other movements on your college campuses? Does your black student union do activities with your disabled student union? Is there cross-pollination across your LGBT groups and your disability groups? What does it mean to, to recognize disabled people as whole versus seeing them as needing to be fixed? Um, sustainability. Now, I know most of us in jobs think about sustainability solely as a resource thing, as a dollar thing, but this actually means the sustainability of our people. The disabled community is experiencing significant levels of trauma in this moment, coming out of this pandemic, having predicted what was going to happen all along, and having been offered accommodations that are now in many cases being taken away. That's not sustainable. That is not emotionally and mentally sustainable for people with disabilities. And so acknowledging that and figuring out how we get back to that place. Cross disability solidarity. As we're starting to see students with intellectual and developmental disabilities coming on campus, how do we help build their relationships with other disabled students? 
How do we help teach them to stand up for each other, to speak out for each other when we see them experiencing harm? Interdependence, talked about that a little bit earlier. Collective access, we all deserve access. And we all deserve access at the same time. So how do we work to get there? And collective liberation, the notion that my liberation is tied up with all of yours. Next slide, please. Storytelling as power. Um, what is the history of disability at Penn? What is the, the history within the institution of students with disabilities succeeding and thriving? What is the history of disabled students pushing back? This is the history of inclusion and is a history that should be shared with all of your students. Um, the photo is a, a photo of a, a colleague of mine, Clinton Brown, um, who talked about how it took him graduating from Hofstra and becoming an alumni that he had learned that his forebears at the university um, were very active in, in advocating. He had been told that he was one of the first disabled students at Hofstra, um, and that was definitely not the case. And he said that he felt really cheated by that lack of connection to previous generations. And I think that that's something that we don't often talk about. Who are your alumni and what are they doing now? How can they serve as a connecting point for the students that you're serving today? And also being really open about what are the fights and advocacy campaigns that you've had to initiate working with disabled students? What does it look like? Talk about the struggles. I think so many times the work that's done within the disabled student space is very much done behind a, a curtain or very much done um, in a black box and actually sharing, no, this is really hard. We're fighting to make X new building accessible. We're fighting to get more certified deaf interpreters on campus. Talk about what that advocacy is and include your students in those conversations. Next slide, please. Creating a pipeline of leadership. Are you connected um, with students, uh, with your local high school students with disabilities? Are your students connected with them? Is there a state youth leadership forum that you can invite those students in to come and on a campus tour and engage them? Are you connected with uh, internship programs like the Workforce Recruitment Program, which is the largest federal internship program in the country and centers interns with disabilities? The American Association of People with Disabilities has an internship program as well that helps supply interns on Capitol Hill. Are there internships in your state that there's the opportunity to be really truly inclusive of? Caitlin asked, if a student doesn't have a good sense of what they might need in terms of accommodations, I often invite them to tell me what it's like for you, an ex-academic or on-campus situation, and explain that I'm putting accommodations in place for a bad day. Is there something that we could suggest that she add to it? I think that's a really good start. You know, another resource that I think is amazing is the Job Accommodation Network, or JAN. Um, they have a website and an 800 number that somebody can call and talk about what they experience. And JAN has a whole bunch of resources, a whole bunch of research, and can help suggest other ideas and possibilities. You know, I think this is also where connecting students across the board with even with alumni that have the same disability they have can be really powerful. Um, thinking innovatively is really key in this space. I remember um, being in college and my college advisor was a Vietnam vet and he had lost both of his legs in Vietnam. Um, and it was the first time I had ever had a campus faculty member with a disability who I engaged with on a regular basis. And I remember, um, stopping in his office one time to talk to him about something and uh he remarked about how heavy my book bag looked and i was like yeah you know like i have uh like my biology book is just massive and he said to me um he was like well why don't he's like are you gonna sell it back and i was like you know ideally i'd, I'd want to and i pulled it out and it was actually a really old book it had a really crappy cover on it and he said i want to challenge you to think about this differently he's like what if we took this um, uh, what if we took this to facilities and asked them to saw off the binding and hole punched it and threw it in a binder so you only had to take the pages that you needed for that particular day? And I was like, I never would have thought about that. And he, and he told me that um, it was something that he had done when he was in college. And so I think there's just such an opportunity for shared learning 
that often, you know, we sit there and think that there has to be a really complicated or really technical answer for something. When honestly, sometimes just being able to brainstorm with other disabled people helps you find the solution that you need. I, I honestly think that that is what, um, that is the catalyst for disabled Twitter is disabled people just trying to figure things out for themselves and throwing it out there and a bunch of people responding with different types of answers. Next slide, please. What access is and isn't. Um, I think often accessibility is used as a real sort of catch all. Uh, disability accessibility advances disability inclusion. It's not the same thing. In a narrow sense, it's the technical requirements that allow the participation of disabled people in the physical space or access to information. Um, you know, I would say this inclusion is not ramps. Ramps are not inclusion. Um, accessibility is most powerful, though, when it's tied to inclusive practices and policies that welcome and celebrate the participation of disabled people and not simply compliance with laws. Think about that. What would it look like to welcome and celebrate the participation of disabled people on campus? And honestly, in this next phase of COVID, accessibility and inclusion should become way more streamlined and way more mainstreamed because more people than just those who, you know, culturally or politically acknowledge um, a disability identity are going to need to access those things. Next slide, please. How can colleges help us? So this is um, a photo of myself and uh, the leadership of the Disabled Student Union up at Harvard, who I met with um, almost a month ago today. And it was really interesting sitting down with them um, because they were very much aware of the privilege that they have being students at Harvard. And then they started talking about what campus life is like for them. And they started sharing about how there's only three dorms that they can live in um, and two cafeterias that they can use. And that there's a ramp on campus that they not so lovingly refer to as the evil Knievel ramp of death. Um, because it is not at a legal height. Um, it's always iced over in the winter. And you really have to fundamentally take your life in your own hands if you're going to use that ramp. And we were talking about um, what it means to be included on campus. And somebody said, you know, there's an art storm and I'm an arts major, but I don't get to live in the art storm because it's not accessible. Um, you know, and it was really striking because the choices that she has are so fundamentally limited um, for a career path that's really entrenched in creativity. Um, you know, it's also the importance, colleges can also help by serving as a place for gathering for students to talk about these things. Um, thinking about opportunities for co-hosting events, as I said earlier, like, are you bringing in your uh, minority serving student organizations? Are you doing stuff in collaboration with your career center? I once attended a site visit at a college in Washington State um, where their disabled student services office and their career center were co-located. This was also a college that had integrated universal design for learning into 90% of their, their majors. And so I remember asking them, well, how many students with disabilities do you have on campus? And they said to me, they're like, we don't know. I was like, what do you mean you don't know? And they're like, we don't know because of you know the rollout of universal design, not all of our students need to disclose. And they're like, and the fact that our disabled students office and our career services office are co-located means that, you know, we don't know who's coming in for what. And we're cross-trained. And so we can meet to talk about accommodations and we can meet to talk about careers and we can talk about the accommodations they use now and how they automatically transfer to their careers. So there is no segregation around the notion of disability accommodations and employment. It becomes a seamless conversation. And I remember visiting a couple of other colleges at the time, and they made fun of that one college because they were like, they're losing out on so much money because they're not, you know, they don't know how many disabled students that they have. And I remember saying, but their students are much more included and are much more, you know, they're part of the campus life. They, they have the accommodations wherever they need to go. There's no drama. Um, 
you know, they are understanding of how the accommodations play out in the workplace. Um, and teachers understand how to teach in such a way that it meets the needs of their students every semester. And so there really is this push and pull about what is the right approach. You know, and I think it, it really does need to be a conversation that's centered around the students and their needs, but there needs to be a place for those conversations and students need to be centered in it and at the table as, as it continues. Next slide, please. Um, and here is my contact information. And so if folks wanna get in touch and wanna talk, I'm happy to do that. And I'm also happy to take any additional questions you all may have. Most, uh, yes, most, I love this question. Most universities have DEI initiatives, but not all DEI initiatives and statements actively engage include people with disabilities. Do I have suggestions for how students, faculty, and staff work to influence slash be a part of DEI initiatives? Um, I will say what I said up top, which is you cannot have inclusion without students with disabilities. Um, I think this is where a mix of student advocacy, faculty advocacy, and staff advocacy is imperative. Um, just one will not make it successful. I think having a concerted effort around the kind of change that you wanna see and working backwards from there, whether it be you know, inclusion in a statement, whether inclusion in an, in an initiative, I think this is also where you show up to other DEI events and you advocate when there are no accommodations because often there are not accommodations. Um, I think you you do the entourage mentality, which is every event you go to, you bring two or three new people with you and you show up on mass and you ask for why you're not included and you ask for why your needs aren't being met. Um, we also know that disproportionately, there will not be successful education outcomes for students of color, for LGBT students, et cetera, if they're not able to access accommodations. And so really having this understanding um, that accommodations benefit the presence of all students, the participation of all faculty and all staff. Uh, you know, I think this is also the opportunity where you can bring in experts on the outside to talk about these issues, ensure that if there is a panel that you bring in an expert on disability inclusion, there are many that are exceptional. Um, folks like Deb Daggett is one um, who served as the, first, well, the second chief diversity officer in corporate America. Her boss, Ted Childs, was the first at IBM. Um, and then she became the second when she was, the, uh, she was at Merck Pharmaceuticals. Um, I think that there are a number of other people that you can bring in to have this conversation and people that re represent the nexus of multiple identities is really key because if you see yourself being included because you belong to a certain race or a certain gender, um, but you can't access the space because you need a sign language interpreter or you need materials in large print, you're still being denied access. Um, and that still is a sense of, of discrimination. Another question, um, mentioned returning to the before pandemic ways of learning on campus has been traumatizing for students with disabilities. What can we do to support these students through the transition? <sighs> Building spaces for them to acknowledge the suck, to quote the term that, that Tammy De Senator Duckworth often uses. Students are really struggling. I think it's also important to remember that the disability community lost more than any other community as a result of the pandemic. And because of the fact that the pandemic is still going on, in many cases, disabled folks haven't been able to grieve because you can't go to a funeral if you're worried about going outside and catching COVID. Um, you know, I think thinking about what are the maximum flexibilities that you can afford these students? How are we fighting for these students in this moment? Um, what does it mean to um, to connect them with the services and supports that, that you do have that are available in this space. I think it also means having peer support groups, being able to pull together groups of students and saying, hey, let's get together, you know, come in and have lunch um, and let's talk about how this is rough right now. Um, opportunities to really build peer support and peer mentoring are, are really critical in the space. Um, you know, let's see, uh, can I comment on resources and inclusion for faculty and staff with disabilities? 
Yes. Um, man, there's something I really want to share with you all, but I can't share with you all yet. But I would just say keep an eye on the news of what the found, Ford Foundation is doing over the next year, um, because we're going to have actually something really big on this. Um, you know, there is a large number of faculty and staff with disabilities, many of whom may not disclose, many of whom might not receive the accommodations they need. How are you all mobilizing? You know, how are you all getting together? I haven't seen any specific tools. Um, you know, the Association of Higher Education and Disability does have various caucuses, and I know that they are talking about how to create more mechanisms for um, students and faculty with disabilities to engage, but there hasn't been enough done on this, and I think that there's a real opportunity going forward, and there will be some real things moving later in the year. I wish I could say more, but I can't yet. Um, thank you for the focus on the overlap of ableism and other forms of systemic oppression. Can you share examples or successful strategies or initiatives for addressing this intersectionality? I look to the work of folks like Vilissa Thompson, who created the Black Disability Syllabus and has been doing some really amazing work at the nexus of race, gender, and disability. Um, I think uh, there is a growing Black Disability Studies space um, happening and, and creating creation of their own subgroup from the, um, uh, from, the, from the Center for Disability Studies to specifically focus on anti-Blackness and ableism. Um, you know, initiatives that I've seen work really well are those things that bring together students across those, those communities on campus whether it be conversations around, for example, um, Black History Month, talking about the role that the Black Panther Party had in supporting the 504 sit-ins. Um, you know, in uh, Asian American Awareness or Asian American Heritage Month, talking explicitly um, around the AAPI community and mental health, where there's some really powerful things happening right now and powerful conversations that are, that are happening. Um, you know, I think there are, there's so much more that can be done in that space and really needs to be done in that space. Um, and I think that is the last question I have. Um, thank you so much. It was a pleasure to be here with all of you today. Rebecca, what a rich conversation. Thank you so much for uh, just such a wealth of knowledge and information and insight and I know people are incredibly fired up by uh, your, your talk and um, the questions are just a small representation of that. So thank you um, for just prompting our thinking. Again, this presentation will be uh, posted on our website and so you'll have the opportunity to revisit um, the many rich details that Rebecca, uh, rich uh, just information that Rebecca shared with us today. Thank you again for your wisdom and thank you all um, for your time. We are just getting started today and so we hope that you will stay with us throughout the day. The next session uh, begins at 11.15, and that session will be led by Naomi Jackson on why be happy when you could be normal. So we encourage you to take a break, and then you will need to join the unique link for that event. So after this event um, ends, go ahead and log back in a little before 11.15 at the new link, and we hope to see many of you there. Thank you again, and thank you to our speaker today, Rebecca. Everyone have a wonderful rest of your morning.